Hello and welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, speaking to you from my office as Dean of the Pannoni Honors College at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today my guest is Deborah Lipstadt, DeRote Professor of Modern Jewish History and Holocaust Studies at Emory University. Dr. Lipstadt received international attention in 1996 when the British author David Irving sued her for libel for characterizing him as a Holocaust denier. Dr. Lipstadt won that suit and wrote a book about it, History on Trial, My Day in Court with a Holocaust Denier. Deborah Lipstadt, welcome to the Drexel Interview. Thank you very much. Well, as I mentioned in my introduction, you were sued by David Irving mm -hmm. for accusing him of Holocaust denial. It was your 1993 book, Denying the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. So tell us, what was the basis of his suit? The basis of his suit was um, that he claimed he was not a Holocaust denier. He just had a different interpretation of the Holocaust um, and that I had maligned him by calling him a denier. Um, possibly what's important before we get into the details is for um, listeners to, uh, viewers to, to recognize that the libel laws in England are the mirror image of the libel laws in the United States. In the United States, if I were to say, you libeled me, I would have to prove you libeled me. Um, in England, the burden of proof, the onus is on the author, the creator of the words. So if I say you libeled me, you have to prove you told the truth. So that immediately constricted my options. Uh, I couldn't you know, say I'm going to ignore this. Many people told me to ignore me, including many academics told me to ignore it. And I just knew I couldn't do that because if I did, he would win by default. So his Well, you had to do something, right? I mean, you, he would have won then. He would have won. Had yeah. I not fought it, he would have won. And then what would he have gotten had he won? He could have... We, uh, because the American legal system and the British legal system are the closest, you know, we see each other as very complementary. Um, there's this possibility he could have attached my property, could have got after my, you know, my my home, my whatever. Uh, but that wasn't really what was motivating me. What was motivating me more was the thought that if I didn't w if I didn't fight, if I had just said this is in England, I'm not fighting this. I don't take this seriously. This man is such an, uh, a blatant Holocaust denier. He's proud of being a denier uh, that I'm just going to ignore this. Um, he would have won by default. Had he won by default, then he could say, my David Irving theory of the Holocaust or comments about the Holocaust are correct because the British court found that Deborah Lipstadt was guilty of libel for calling me a Holocaust denier. Ipso facto, I, David Irving, am not a Holocaust denier. So once that was made really clear to me, you know, by my lawyers, and once I understood that, and that didn't take very long, I knew I had to fight. So one thing I don't understand mm -hmm. is how this man mm -hmm. had a reputation, of a, a decent reputation, mm -hmm. as a historian, mm -hmm. and major publishers were publishing his work, mm -hmm. even though he was supporting supportive of Hitler, mm -hmm. and he was a Holocaust denier. He was, he was absolutely So Holocaust. how do you explain this from the publishing point of view? You know, he wasn't supportive of Hitler while Hitler was alive, obviously, but he, Hitler, he used to talk to people. He, there are documented exchanges he had with people where he would say that Hitler spoke about the fact that someday a, a great man will come about and be his biographer, and he saw himself as that, uh, that man. Um, and uh, he was very, very, he talked about the Fuhrer, and he talked about, in fact, one point. He called him the Fuhrer? Yeah, he, well, he would say the Fuhrer this, or the Fuhrer yeah. said that, and said, uh, sometimes he'd say Hitler, but sometimes he'd say the Fuhrer. At one point, it was, it was the last day of, of, court, of hearings, um, he turned to the judge, and he wanted to say, my lord, which is my lordship, or how you would address the judge, and he said, my Fuhrer. The whole courtroom stopped breathing in unison for a second, but that's, that's, but he was, but to go back to your point, which is a serious point, um, St. Martin's Press was publishing his books. His books were published by leading publishers. Macmillan, he, I Macmillan think. Macmillan yeah. did some. Um, he was, he's a very prolific writer. He's a very good writer. His German is impeccable. Um, and he would get these documents, you know, maybe he'd go to Germany. I'm, I'm imagining that this is how he got some of them. And some would come up and say, you know, Uncle Helmut was uh, the secretary to Hitler's closest 
advisor or something, and we have all his letters, or we have his diaries here, you take them, or here's a copy of them. So he had all sorts of stuff, and, um, uh, but about the late 70s, he began to become a Holocaust denier as such. Up until then, he was a defender of Hitler, and he, was, he wrote a book called Hitler's War, in which he argued that Hitler didn't know about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Now, had he known about the Holocaust, he would never have let it happen. So it was, again, this whitewashing of Hitler. So to prove that you were right in calling him a denier, you had to give the sorts of facts. Now, mm -hmm. was this like the Nuremberg trial? No, well, no. My, my lawyer, Anthony, my British lawyer, Anthony Julius, I mean, it was a British legal team, a wonderful legal team. You know, I, I, I dedicated my book to them on the, that's because they really were terrific. Um, they did something very interesting, which is an academic I found very appealing. And what's why I call the book History on Trial. They tra followed his footnotes. They said, we're not here to prove that the Holocaust happened. We're here to prove that Deborah Lipstadt told the truth when she said this man is a denier, a liar, a falsifier of history. Mm. How did they do that? They took what he said, they took his statements about the Holocaust, and they tracked his footnotes back to the sources. So in other words, they weren't proving how many people were murdered at Auschwitz. They were proving that when he said only, and I put only in quotes, 64,000 people died at Auschwitz. When you track the, back to the sources, you very quickly see uh, that uh, the, the source for which he's citing is not the death record at Auschwitz. Or he would say uh, Hitler, the night of Kristallnacht, November 1938, when there was this nationwide pogrom against Jews and Jewish institutions, um, all or, uh, authorized by the, the Nazis, by the hierarchy, by the Third Reich. Um, that in the middle of the night, he said, Hitler sent out a telex saying, stop the madness. He tried to stop it. And it went on without his permission. Well, he cites a telex. When you look at the original of the telex, it says, um, uh, Jewish shops and the like are arson against Jewish shops and the like is to be halted. Because what was happening is Jewish shops and Jewish institutions, synagogues, were being set afire. Mm -hmm. But fire doesn't know to stop. If it's on a, if it's on a street mm -hmm. where the synagogue is next to some other thing, the fire doesn't stop when it gets to the edge of the synagogue. It keeps going. And entire blocks were going up in smoke. So he said his telex was to stop the arson. Mm -hmm. and because it was, tr it was going beyond It was going the beyond Jewish what they order. wanted. Exactly, yeah. exactly. No arson. Send out the message. So no he order. was a false historian. He, he's a fa a fa yeah. he, I don't even call him a historian. Yeah. And I was intrigued. A corrupt history? He, well, he, he writes about history, but he, write, he lies. You know, the thing there is, and, and you're in the academic world, you're, you, you know this as a dean, that there's a certain unwritten pact. Uh, amongst academics. I'm not going to track your footnotes unless I want to do research on exactly mm -hmm. what you wrote and I want to see how you interpreted something or whatever. Um, that when you put something in a book, I can trust it's not misquoted. I can trust you didn't skew the evidence. I can trust that you didn't take a telex that said arson is to be halted and then say in my book, he, he sent out a uh, a telex saying, stop the madness, trying to put a halt to everything. And yet when someone writes the sorts of things he does, that's what footnotes are very valuable right. for. But nobody, even as time went on, as he became more and more of a denier, people said, oh, he's a denier. I'm not going to follow. I'm not taking what he said seriously. By the time he got to me, he already had a reputation as a denier. But nobody had ever bothered to follow his footnotes. And we went back and followed his footnotes on lots of things. He was one of those who wrote about the bombing of Dresden. And when you follow his footnotes, I mean, he starts out with a death toll of 35,000, then the next edition it's of uh, Germans. 60,000 Germans, the Allies killed. 60,000, then I think at one point it gets up to over 200,000, depending which edition you're looking at. Um, so if you look at his, his details, you know, you see this is, this is corrupted history. This is made up history. So what we did is we showed the, the judge in the trial, it was a bench trial, not a jury trial, um, that... I think 35 or 36 different instances where if you track back his footnotes, there's a lie, there's a distortion. And one of our, um, again, as a historian, I really love this, we didn't uh, call survivors as witnesses because we didn't want to subject them to being cross-examined by this man who we thought it, his objective would be to humiliate them and, mm -hmm. and, and embarrass them. Um, but uh, And we also didn't want to suggest to the 
judge that we had to prove that the Holocaust happened. Yeah. So instead, that's demeaning. Yes, exactly. We don't prove. We don't have trials proving World War II happened, the Korean yeah. War happened, whatever. Um, so we assembled a dream team of historians, and they each took a different portion of the corpus of his work and analyzed it. Um, and our lead historical witness was Richard Evans from Cambridge, Regis mm -hmm. Professor King's, the King, the Queen's Professor from from Cambridge in in England. And he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, but I think I've got it pretty close, that every reference that David Irving makes to the final solution, to Jews, to the Holocaust, um, is either a, a product of a, a change date, uh, different uh, change people present at a meeting, uh, a misquotation, a fabrication, a tissue, and this is a quote, a tissue of lies. Yeah. And at one point, uh, Professor Evans said, if David Irving said good morning to me, I'd look outside the window <laughs> first to make sure. So we were exposing, we were exposing the modus operandi of hardcore deniers, mm -hmm. those who say, you know, this never happened. And partially as a result of this trial, which resulted in an overwhelming positive verdict for us. I mean, the judge just sort of took him apart point by point by point in his verdict, in his judgment, um, was to put the lie to Holocaust denial. So thinking about the trial itself, which must have been both exhilarating and grueling, what was the most disturbing and the most satisfying aspect? Obviously yeah, satisfying, a, I guess, was the a, verdict. Right, right. But it's, no, it's a very good question. Um, I think it was the session, and this may have been actually over two days, um, where we were demonstrating his anti-Semitism. And he was so almost reveling in, in expressing anti-Semitic views. At one point he cited Elie Wiesel, and he, Elie Wiesel, he would say, and he kept saying, Wiesel, Wiesel, mm. and he'd, he'd giggle, you know, um, smile to himself, this was a great little joke. Uh, or he'd talk, he'd talk about Jews in the most derogatory way. And on that same day, we were also addressing his racism. And his racism is horrible. We had gotten access through the courts to tapes of speeches that he gave to his followers. He had them all collected, and we got access to them. The court, he had to turn them over to us mm. to read, to listen to. Um, and at one point, he gives a speech. And it's to a group of his followers, his, you know, his accolades or whatever. And he says something, I was just on vacation in England, he names a part of England, and it was so wonderful. The whole time I was there, I hardly saw any blacks. And there's laughter in the audience. So and wait a second, there was laughter. Is this? Not in the courtroom, in oh, the, in on the, the tape. Oh, on, on the, the tape. tape. On oh, the I tape. Oh. So they laugh. So um, he said, no, don't, I'm not a racist. I'm happy when I see blacks arriving at Heathrow, and I'm happier yet when I see them leaving. And then he said, but then I turned on the BBC News, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, I have the exact in my, in my book. Um, I turned on the BBC News, and I saw one of them reading our news to us. It's our news we should be reading. Again, laughter. Then he goes on to say, here's what I would like. Dinner jacketed gentlemen reading the important news. Hmm. Women reading the unimportant news. And then he names a famous uh, British newscaster, Trevor MacDonald, I believe his name was, is. And he said, and uh, he could read the news of criminals and drug busts. Well, Trevor MacDonald is, is a man from the Caribbean, so hmm. he's a black man. Um, great laughter. So when my lawyer read out this transcript in the courtroom, he would get to a point, and he would read laughter, and he'd say, laughter, Mr. Irving, laughter. And at one point, at that point, Irving turned to the judge and say, uh, Mr. Rampton, who was my barrister, the person in the wig who you know presents <laughs> in the courtroom, um, is trying to paint me as a racist. I was not talking about black people. I was talking about women. You know, so that made, it, just a made it okay. Do you think it had something, to, do you think this tells us something about British culture? <sighs> I mean, would this, could this possibly it, no, happen No, I think in he would have been exposed earlier in America. Yeah. But he was here a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, there's it was certain, um, what, what did tell me something about British culture was a number of people who came to his defense. Mm -hmm. Not about what he said, but that they painted it as if I was um, trying to silence him. Yeah. And I kept saying, you know, people would say to me, well, you're suing him. I'd say, no. 
I don't believe in taking history into the courtroom. I don't believe in these kind of laws. He was so suing you. He sued me, yeah. but there was this general, you know, he, oh, he, she's suing him. Right? Huh. Well, I know that, uh, I guess it was a few years later, he was in Austria and he was sentenced to mm -hmm. three years in prison. Right, right. I think he served some time, and he mm -hmm. had been... He had been found guilty years before, years before, and then he had gone back, and right. then he was sentenced. That, that had nothing to do with nothing me. Nothing to do. <laughs> right. But I, I did read that you said you were opposed to that. And right. could you explain to us why? Uh, in fact, I just participated in a debate at the Oxford Union, mm -hmm. which, you know, is one of the oldest debating societies in the world. Um, and I, uh, it was about the criminalization of Holocaust and all, which I opposed the criminalization. Um, I don't believe in criminalizing speech, uh, political speech, um, for a number of reasons. First of all, we have that pesky thing called the First Amendment, which is hanging on by its fingernails, but still has, has some clout in this world, in this country. Um, so that's one thing. And, and, and I, as a subsidiary of that point, um, I, I tremble at the thought of politicians deciding what is what can be said and what can't be said? I think that's a terrible situation to get into. Number two or three, um, I think when you outlaw something, you make it into forbidden fruit, mm -hmm. and suddenly it gets passed around, and people want to know. And there, especially young young people, there's a supposition that there must be something to it if you if you're outlawing it. So that was another reason that I was against it. And I think the the third or fourth reason would be that it suggests that we, that we don't have the facts to de defeat deniers. Mm. And my trial was all about history on trial. We used history to defeat him. One of the more gratifying moments, you ask gratifying moments, I'll, I'll give you two gratifying moments. One was when I, a, an undergraduate of mine who was uh, from Emory, who was studying at Oxford that year, and he would make a point of coming into the trial whenever he could. So he came in two or three days to, to listen to, to, first you had to get into the courtroom, it was a long line, but he managed to get in. And he was there on one day when um, we had received, the, the State of Israel had re released the Eichmann diaries, diaries Adolf Eichmann, the Nazi war criminal, wrote when he was in his jail cell, um, which talk about gassing and talk about knowing of the death, and they had released it to us. And, um, those were still the day, 2000, it was the days of discs. So my barrister came in carrying this little yellow disc and he said, Your Lordship, I have received this morning from the Attorney General of the State of Israel, who's head of the archives, the State Archives, a copy of the Eichmann Diary. They have released it to us for our use. They will be releasing it publicly in 24 hours. But by British law, I have to share it with Mr. Irving right away. But they have asked that it not be released publicly till they release it. Mm -hmm. um, he said, um, so uh, I, I must get a guarantee from Mr. Irving that he will not put this, release this um, or put it on his website before it's official. So the judge turned to him and said, uh, Mr. Irving, do you agree to that? He said, well, I'll, I'll try to make sure it doesn't get in at, to public hands. And my barrister said, that's not good enough. And he said, well, I won't put it up on my website. But he had lots of other people putting it. And my barrister said, that won't, that's not good enough. He, and he went on with all he finally said, no, I will make sure it's not shared. And at that point, this diary, which hadn't seen the light of day in 40 years, was, mm -hmm. suddenly, was, was handed over. And my student who was there said, a 40-year-old document in a trial in 2000 with the judge ruling on this, he said, history is alive. I'm going, I'm going to go do a PhD in history. And he <laughs> did, he did. He really? Did, yeah, he so, was inspired. Yeah, he was inspired. Well, I wonder what you think about, because we're talking about free speech, and all the brouhaha going on about free speech mm -hmm. on college campus. You're at Emory, right. where there was something recently with chalk. <laughs> yes, it was a very, yes. we, you want, I don't know if you want me to explain this. I don't think we okay, have to go you know, into yeah, it, I think but I, the, I wonder right. what your thoughts are about the idea of speech codes, microaggressions, uh, yes, safe I think, zones, I so think there's, there's been a, a intellectual coddling of students on campus. Um, I, I recently heard Salman Rushdie, he was in residence at Emory for quite a while, speak, and he talked about the university as a hurt-free zone. <laughs> and um, I think the university is a place where you go to have your ideas challenged. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean the professor can say, I disagree with you politically and you can't say that. Mm -hmm. I think the freedom of speech has to be, an academic freedom has to go for students as well as for faculty. 
But to create this, you know, microaggressions, and you're going to read something here which may disturb you, that's what universities are all about. We had this incident at Yale earlier yes. this year where the um, members of the administration and some of the chaplains and others pre-Halloween said, you know, don't dress up in anything that uh, might insult someone. And the wife of one of the masters of one of the houses uh, wrote a very, very balanced and I thought very restrained thing saying, you know what, this is, not the uni this is not a nanny society where the university has to take you by the hand. If you're at a party and someone's wearing something that's insulting, go up and tell them it's insulting. And she was vilified. Now there's been a, a, a bat, you know. A, a I will tell you that I have heard people say that they found that email that she wrote loathsome. Really? Yes. Well, so I, I don't want yeah, to dwell right, on that. Well, yeah, I want exactly. to go on to your work. But I think that yeah. uh, it's talking about microaggressions. Yeah. Look, I don't believe in incitement. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in hate speech. I don't think you should, you know, I think uh, racism, anti-Semitism, overt racism, overt anti-Semitism, demeaning of another group um, doesn't have a place on the campus. But to create this protective, protective safe zone, um, it's not going to work when you go out into the real world. Yeah. What what's your view of anti-Semitism today? Do you think it's increased or taken? A new I think form? it has increased. I think it has increased. I think it's taken some new forms. Um, I think that whereas over centuries it came in the main from the right, political right, from conservative groups, we're seeing it much more uh, from the left. And then we also see uh, something that I choose to call, others choose to call it other ways. Uh, extremism in the Islamic community. I'm not saying the Islamic community in Toto was extremist. I think that would be not only incorrect, but insulting. And it attacks, well, we saw it, they attacked Charlie Hebdo, they attacked Salman, Salman Rushdie, they attacked, and they attacked Hyper Kasher, the Jewish supermarket, the, the Brussels, Belgium, um, Jewish museum, synagogues, etc. cetera. Um, it's, it's a kind of, it's an anti-Semitism that is also opposed to um, that morphs or grows into attack on Western democratic liberal values. And it's what universities stand for, and I think it could be very dangerous. Well, I want, before our time is up, to talk a little bit about this movie uh -huh. that will be released soon. It will be called History on Trial. No, it'll be called Denial. 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 And it's starring Rachel Weiss mm -hmm. as you. Right. Uh, Tom Wilkinson as David Irving. And it has a screenplay by the eminent David, screen, Hare. David Hare. Yeah, right. Sir David Hare wrote the screenplay. Who's a wonderful oh, he's screenwriter. A, he's a wonderful screenwriter. He wrote yeah. The Reader. He wrote Hours. He's written Plenty, which is going to be on Broadway with Rachel Weiss in it, exactly when the movie is coming out. Uh, Tom Wilkinson plays my barrister, D um, Timothy Spall. Oh, he does. Okay. Timothy Spall, who was both in the Harry Potter movies and in, in um, Turner on the, the the movie on the painter and many other things. He's one of British Britain's finest actors. And Mick Jackson is the director. He did The Bodyguard. He did uh, Temple Grandin so stories. What do you think of this movie? Well, I, mean, I was I, privileged I, yeah. to be on the set for uh -huh. the filming of portions of it. And you know what you see on the set and what it eventually becomes are two different things because the real cooking is when the director sits yeah. with the editor and puts it together. Um, but the acting I saw was incredible. One of the things I wanted to ask you, though, is interesting that you're taking a real life situation and making a representation of it. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that when you do that, there's distortion. And I wonder what you think, since it's your story, right. and you are so tuned in as a historian mm -hmm. to truth and accuracy, if that has occurred to you. Yes, it was. there were some very difficult moments in the creation of it and working with David Hare. I didn't, David Hare did all the work himself, but he would, he was very generous in consulting with me and sending me scripts and talking to me about different points. Came to Emory, shadowed me for a couple of days. Um, and even talking to Rachel Weiss, who was also, I had a, a wonderful experiences with her. I, I just have the utmost respect for her, not only as a professional, but as someone who wanted to get it right. One night, uh, I was in Barcelona at a conference, and she was filming, and they call, she called me, and she said, Deborah, say law courts for me. So I want to get the exact intonation. Oh, so, so she tries to she, imitate Well, she, or to come close to yeah. my speech. Um, but at the same time, she was very clear. She said, this is not like when Helen Mirren 
plays the queen. Or everybody goes to see it, did she get the queen? <laughs> or years ago, Jacqueline Bissett played Jackie Kennedy, and did she get Jackie Kennedy? She said, this is me taking what I know now of Deborah Lipstead, my encounters. We, we spent a lot of time together on the phone and Skyping, things like that. And interpret, she called it uncon she called acting unconscious cooking. And I was sitting in her once in her, in her kitchen and telling her, she asked me stories about my mother and my ra how I was raised. And she said, I don't know where or when, but those stories will inform how I portray mm -hmm. you. But it's not going to be you. I'm not imitating you. I'm creating my version of it. Um, but not only Rachel, but BBC Films, which is one of the producers, and Participant Media, which just won the Oscar for Spotlight, uh, were absolutely adamant on getting the historical detail right. Oh, that's so great. It was great. I'm looking forward to thank seeing you. it. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I want to thank you so much for being here today. It's and been a pleasure. My, for me too. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us today at the Drexel Interview.